I guess it was last two weeks ago, two weeks ago. But uh, Pastor Don began to talk, and it just, uh, I was just captivated. You know, I could not, uh, I just couldn't stop listening. He had so much good information. I thought, man, I'd love, one, to get this on video so that we can uh, have that, but also uh, for our church to have a chance to hear that as well. But um, before we get into Ukraine, let me grab my notes here. I've walked away from them. So, Don, you, um, now you've, how long have you been pastoring? Your, your wife's name, Janine, she's here. Yes. Janine, wave at everybody real quick. But uh, she's here with him tonight. But uh, t- tell us just a little bit about yourself. How long have you been pastoring? Um, I've been uh, pastoring at Mount Anderson for a little over 17 years. Uh, yeah, 17 years in March. And uh, previous to that, I served at uh, Boger City Baptist Church as an associate pastor there and uh, served in a Christian school for a couple of years prior to that. So Okay. Yeah. All right. Are you from this area? I actually am. Uh, I'm back home now. I'm living in the metropolis of Pumpkin Center, North Carolina. So, <laughs> okay. Yes, yes, yes. All right. Yeah. So you and Janine, do you all have any children? Uh, we do. We have three uh, grown children. Okay. Uh, Emily, our oldest daughter, she's, I'm going to make sure I get these, uh, these ages right. She's 34. Uh, she's married and has two children, so we have two grandchildren with by her, and then uh, we have a daughter who's uh, 32 who just lives uh, not too awful far from us, right up 150, and then we uh, have a son who's 30, and uh, he's married to uh, Peyton Harris. They live over in Wake Forest near uh, Southeastern Seminary, and they have a son who's a little over a year old now, Turner, okay. and so he's our third grandchild. Great. Well, congratulations yeah. on that. Yeah. Okay. Now, now, where did you go to seminary and all? Uh, I actually went to Bible college. That's, uh, that's the education that I have. I had Bible college at Fruitland. Uh, okay. And so okay. That's, uh, that's my background. I kind of went into uh, ministry, I'd say, a little bit late. I was uh, pushing 40. I was 30, okay. 37, 38, and, uh, and so went back uh, for that uh, Bible training there. And Great. So, yeah. Okay. Well, um, I'll now kind of hit on that a little bit, but let me just uh, jump into this um, at Mount Anderson. And maybe you had prior experience with this. I don't know, but I, I knew just from talking to other people that uh, you had a a great love for the the people of Ukraine and have done many many mission trips over there. Right. Uh, talk a little bit about how that got going and how long you've been doing those trips and so forth um the first time that uh, i went was in 1998 uh, i was just serving as a lay person teaching sunday school uh, church uh, new life uh, church in lincoln and i had a friend of mine uh, who was uh, a pastor of a church in georgia and uh, we were at uh, the pastor's conference actually at uh, jacksonville florida and he had been to eastern europe a couple of times and uh, we had got to know, know each other, and um, he um, said he was taking a trip over to Ukraine in the summer. And I had had, uh, it's a long story, so I'm not going to get into all that, but uh, the Lord had really been uh, working in my life concerning uh, some of the things that were going on after the, the uh, breakdown of the Soviet Union. And so when he asked me um, about, he said, I'm taking a trip, and I really think you ought to go. And I said, okay, all right. And I said something to my wife about it, and she said, yeah. I I didn't know how she'd respond, but she said, yeah, I think you need to go. Uh, The Lord speaks to me about things, too. And so we we were in agreement with that. And so uh, in uh, 1998, we took a team. There were five people from here in Lincoln and three guys from Georgia. And we went to a a city in Ukraine uh, called Izum. Now, if you watch much of the news today, that in the eastern part of Ukraine right now, that is the hot spot. Uh, That's going to be the next place where uh, the Russian forces are going to mass. They already are. Uh, Of course, we had no idea of that at that time. But uh, we went over in 1998, and it's just... it's, it really it was a life-changing experience. I'd never been anywhere before, you know, other than the United States. And uh, so we, we hop on a plane, and uh, we go overseas, and we get to uh, Kiev, and uh, we get on this train, and it's like 95 degrees. Uh, we get on an overnight train, a slow train, about 10 hours. Uh, none of the windows open. It's just re- re- 
remarkably hot. I mean, it's just terrible, you know, and we're spoiled Americans, and so we're making this trip over thinking we're all going to die of heat exhaustion before we get there. And so the long trip overnight, uh, and I remember my pastor, he was with us on this trip at the time, and uh, he he made the comment, said, you know, Jesus never had it this good. So that kind of put things in perspective. And uh, so anyway, we ended up in this, this city called Azum, and um, it's uh, southeast of Kharkiv, which is also a lot in the news right now. And so we ended up there, and um, we uh, we didn't really, I didn't, I don't think any of us knew exactly what we were doing. But we started, we went out into the town square and we started inviting people and telling people that we were going to have a meeting and uh, we're going to, you know, going to do a program. Now, we were the only show in town that most of them had never seen a real live American before. So uh, we, we, we drew a lot of attention. And it's interesting because uh, we were able for just a small amount of money to rent out a building that was uh, called a Pioneer Palace. Uh, it had been used for years under communism to teach young kids about communism and that there was no God. And so we rented that out. We did uh, services inside. A couple of guys were really good musicians. We did services inside. We had kids. I was mainly with the kids outside. I have pictures where just hundreds of kids came. And so as a result of that, uh, there was a church started. There was a lot of professions of faith made that week. And that church has been just a, a, a missionary sending for that whole area there right now. And um, unfortunately, uh, in the last couple of weeks, that uh, church has been bombed and pretty much destroyed. Uh, so uh, that's kind of how I got started uh, with that. And it just it really did change my life. And I just have had a heart and a passion for Ukraine ever since. So, so, so I just got to ask you, that was prior to you sensing that God was calling you to be a pastor. Exactly. Did that play a role in that? It did. It did. I think it was at that point. um, uh, The Lord had really already been working in my heart, but it was at that point I think I really just surrendered and said, Lord, whatever you want me to do, that's what I'll do. And uh, we didn't know. I think my wife thought we'd end up on the mission field, and who knows, we may yet before it's over. Uh, But uh, uh, so we just surrendered to that, and uh, the Lord just, uh, we just tried to go through the doors as, as God has has opened them, and so that's uh, uh, kind of kind of that story. It's, it's interesting too. Today, just right before I came in here, um, I got a message from uh, I say she's a kid, but she's probably twenty one or twenty two now. Uh, I really I did I'd never uh, really never really known her when she was small or knew her older sister. But in nineteen ninety eight, um, her mom was saved on that first trip, oh. and then later on, her dad got saved. This was years later. And when I was over there in 2017 and then again in 2019, but 2017, uh, I was in their home with all their family. And now uh, her sister is married to a pastor in Ukraine. And uh, they have had to flee, of course, because it's really just devastated. It's destroyed. And so she messaged me there in Germany. And uh, so they're, they're, they're getting along all right. So, but, yeah. Okay. Well, how many trips would you say you've made? Uh, I'm not sure. I think uh, we've tried to count, I think, maybe 24 or 25 to Ukraine. Uh-huh. Okay. Yeah. And, and when you go, typically, yeah. is it? Uh, do you have any particular type of ministry you're doing when you typically go? Or? Uh, it's been different. The, uh, the first year, I mean, it was purely evangelism. I mean, we, you know, we, we just gathered people and we would preach. We, we did so many things on that first trip. It was, I, I've described it as like walking through the book of Acts. I mean, it was just amazing. And, uh, and so, we, and we've done, you know, evangelism trips. We've done, uh, we've worked in orphanages, did camps in orphanages before in the Harkiv area. Uh, we, did a, we did a soccer camp one year in the Zoom, which is interesting because nobody on our team knew anything about soccer. Uh, but uh, they drew a crowd, and, uh, and so that, that was great. And uh, we've done, uh, like, um, uh, they call them just children's camps. It's really like our v- v- vacation Bible school here. We've done a lot of those, a lot of the kids that have helped and have been a part of those now are grown and they have their own kids and so those are the ones now when I go back that I see and spend time with and and things like that and then we've taken uh, quite a few teams from Mount Anderson our guys are a little more geared towards uh, construction and so a lot of the smaller churches uh, they will uh, purchase a an old house or something and renovate it and make a church out of it and you know in times past you could do that reasonably cheap 
And so we've taken construction teams over and uh, helped to renovate churches and just do do ministry like that. And so uh, I was just over there in December. I went twice last year during the pandemic. And uh, and so basically what I did, those trips, I just kind of went on my own. I had a, a couple friends of mine from Arkansas, which I travel with a lot. And uh, we would go into the, the various churches that we've been in before and just kind of encourage the pastors and just be a part of their services and meet and uh, just kind of kind of hang out. And um, in December, I was actually in a place um, near Chernobyl uh, where the Russians first uh, invaded. And um, it was interesting because it was Ivan Kiev, which is, is the name of the place. And uh, so we were up in all in that area. Uh, where the Russians, they until they backed out of Kiev just recently, they were under Russian control. Mm. So, yeah. Okay. So now, do we have do we have IMB missionaries, Southern Baptist missionaries in in Ukraine, or did we, we have? Yeah, we do, or we did. Uh, the missionaries uh, they've been um, you know uh, pulled out right. uh, just by uh, because of uh, you know the dangerous situation there. Uh, Linda Gray is a is a, a lady who's been uh, in Ukraine and she's been in Kharkiv for a long, long time. Uh, I don't know. Uh, maybe you've seen pictures um, if you've watched uh, some of the social media stuff. There's uh, in Kharkiv. There's a square most. Uh, cities have a square uh, that's kind of the center point of everything. But in Kharkiv, it's a large city. It's about a million, million and a half population. Uh, but when the Russians invaded in 2014, uh, they 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 came, you know, they uh, they came into the eastern part. And at that point in time, there was a group of Christians in Kharkiv that started to pray every day on the square. And they've prayed there every day for eight years, rain or snow, snow, and it gets cold. I was there in January of 2019 and prayed with them and every day. And to my knowledge, they're still doing that. And Linda uh, Gray was there. Uh, there's a couple of other missionaries in that area, and then there's some in Kiev. Uh, and so but they're now um, they're out of, of the country. They're in a neighboring country, and they're helping with, uh, uh, with refugee uh, things like that. And there's another guy, Knut uh, Midriff, who is also him and his wife, Sarah, are missionaries uh, there, but they're, they're pulled out and in Poland right now. Okay. So, um, something just to think about, when you give just your regular offering to the church, there, there's a portion of that that goes to help these missionaries that are in the Ukraine. And even more so, when we take up our Lottie Moon Christmas offering, we've... Um, You've been very generous these past few years in those offerings, and 100% of that money goes to, not even to the administrative cost of uh, the IMB, it goes straight to our missionaries, like the people we're talking about. So you're, you're playing a part in that when you give, and, um, and I, just, I think that's worth pointing out. But, it uh, is, and uh, North Carolina Baptist men, uh, they are very uh, prevalent there in Poland and Hungary and Moldova right now. And so you can also, when you give North Carolina Baptist men, there is a, you can designate it to relief, Ukraine relief. And then there's the sin relief through uh, the, um, I guess, through North American Mission Board, I think is what sin relief is. But that's another area that our Southern Baptist dollars go uh, to help out with those things. And, and I, I know people that are, that are there and uh, on the ground. I know people that's been helped by our uh, Southern Baptist people. So it, that's encouraging to know that they can, they can get there and get help and, be taken care of. Okay, so um, we we all know that there's just a lot of turmoil, and that's probably too simple of a word, but all that's going on in the Ukraine. And um, I was I was just um, I was looking, just thinking about some different scripture here, and one that came to mind was Hebrews thirteen three. It, it says, "Remember those who are in prison, as though in prison with them." And those who are mistreated, since you also are in the body. Mm-hmm. And I, I, just, I just thought it would be good to hear you make a few comments. Why, why do you think we as Americans, as Christians, as believers, as followers of Christ, that, um, that there are believers there in Ukraine, why, why should we care about what's going on there as believers? Why should we care? Well, as as believers, I mean, you know, uh, the Bible teaches us that uh, we're all a part of what uh, we would term the universal church for everyone who has professed Christ. That's the big picture uh, church of everybody. And so, so we're a part of the body of 
Christ. And when one part of the body hurts, then we should hurt with it. When one part of the body has burdens, and I think that we should help bear those burdens. And uh, those folks, uh, uh, I've just interacted with so many pastors, so many churches and things, and it is just... Uh, really, it's inspiring uh, to really see what's going on because sometimes uh, I've made the comment, it's not original with me, someone had shared it with me over there, and uh, one of the things they said about war was it's now church without walls. And so uh, the church, uh, the church, uh, is uh, just ministering and in the midst of all this. I mean, sometimes I think if, if that were, were us, we would probably just be hunk- hunkered down Uh, trying to figure out how to get from day to day, but they're still gathering anywhere that they can, whether it's in a school or in a in a church building or, or a, whatever, it, all these places, because there's just, there's literally, um, I don't know how many, there's probably hundreds of thousands that are in western Ukraine that are still there, and they're just trying to find a place anywhere they can stay. Sometimes there's 20, 30 people in a, in a small Uh, in a small place, uh, somebody, uh, one of my friends, they, their family with a couple of kids, they were in a place, and there's like 20 people staying in a two-room house. So you're, you're talk, we're talking about believers. Believers, so yeah. believers, yeah. And so they're, they, they'll come, and they're taking care of one another, but then they're ministering to others and sharing the gospel. I have a good friend of mine. I've known his wife for a long time over there and uh, known her family. And um, they were talking to me just right after this happened. They, they, they got out of, they were in Kiev. They got out of there. They're in the western part of Ukraine. And only after being out for two or three days, when Sunday came, uh, they had Bible study. They had worship. They shared the gospel. And, you know, they didn't know. I mean, I, was, I had a Zoom meeting with them on Saturday. And uh, they didn't even know if they were going to have anything to eat that night. But come Sunday morning, they were up and they had a worship service and were just ministering to believers, but also unbelievers. Uh, you know, one of the pastors over there, uh, he said last week, he said, even the atheists are reading their Bibles now. Yeah. It, it, it's amazing how quickly we stop complaining about little things mm-hmm. when we get in a situation like this. And not that we're have faced that, but still, I mean, right. you can see that in their lives. I mean, they, they're not even concerned about they don't even have a building now. Right. And um, mm-hmm. it, it's amazing how refining that type of, um, of uh, trial can, can be in somebody's life. Yeah. You, you shared with me about a, um, one, one man that um, you know that uh, he and, I believe that you said he and his family had gotten out and gone into one of the Eastern mm-hmm. Bloc countries and that he was in a large area or a, a, an area where there were a lot of people being housed, mm-hmm. and they found out he was a Christian. Mm-hmm. And um, you, you want to yeah. kind of pick up that story? Yeah, that, that's, a, that's another interesting story. Um, he, uh, uh, Kola is his name, and he's worked with us a couple of times on teams as a, as a translator, interpreter for us. And um, they, they live near, near Kiev, and uh, the, things just got bad in the area, and he's got, he's got kids because the only way you can get out of the country if you're that age is if you have three or more children, you can, the, the man can leave. But if you're between 18 and 60 and you have less than three kids and you can't leave because you're mobilized and could be called to serve. But anyway, they ended up in, uh, in, in uh, Romania, and uh, he... Uh, When he first contacted me, I was at the house, and, you know, the time difference is seven hours difference. So I hadn't gotten real good sleep in six weeks because people, they'll call or they'll message me in the middle of the night. But he called me late one night, and uh, he said they'd gotten to Moldova, and he said it just gotten so bad that they had to leave. And, uh, you know, and he said, we not Moldova, but they got to Romania. And they got to Romania, and he said uh, they, they took us in, And they fed us, and it was just the food was wonderful. And then he just started breaking down. He just started crying on the phone. And finally, he kind of got it together, and he said, I couldn't even eat. He said, because I was thinking about all the people back there that didn't have anything to eat and were, were struggling. Uh, but then uh, a few days later, he was telling me he's in a, in a Romanian church. I, I'm not sure if it's a church, but it's a building that they've been able to rent or do something, uh, a pastor there. And so they had a couple hundred people that are living in this building, 
And because he's a Christian, he was a deacon in the church there at Boring Kiv. And uh, he said, they've asked me to kind of lead out and share the gospel and, and minister and, and, and all that. And so he said, just really pray for me that I'll have wisdom on how to do this and how, how, how to do this. And so here, you know, he's been displaced and with his wife and his children. And God has uh, just gave him a, a great opportunity. I said, I told Cola, I said, you know, it's sort of like the book of Acts. Uh, the Bible says that when they were persecuted, they spread, but everywhere they went, they went preaching Jesus. And he said, you know, he said, that's a good verse. <laughs> I said, yeah, that is a good verse. And so, yeah. yeah. Um, and, yeah, I mean, just just to kind of drive home the, the, the probably the emotions and all that a lot of these people are going through, mm -hmm. I mean, they've had to just walk away from everything. They've walked mm -hmm. away from their homes. They've walked away from their jobs, their livelihood. I mean, if, if we can just imagine that, just mm -hmm. one day we've got an invader coming into our country and we've got to walk away from that. And literally some of them walking away from For it. For miles and miles, yes. Trying to, trying to escape this. Mm -hmm. And, um, and that, that's, that's what's going on, I believe. Mm -hmm. we, uh, I was just uh, received a, a long message about a week or so ago from... Uh, a young girl, she's, I think, maybe 20, 21, but she, um, in 2013, when we were at this small church that we helped build, and I actually had the privilege of preaching the first sermon there, which was actually just outside under a tree, uh, but she was, had been in those children's ministries back in 2013, and now she's grown, and uh, she had since moved from that area uh, to, uh, to a place near the Russian-Belarusian border, and she was able to get out, uh, but she had to walk for 16 miles. She walked 16 miles, and one of the people, there was like three or four of them, several of them, maybe five or six, but anyway, one of the ladies was like six months pregnant, and they literally walked through woods to avoid Russian soldiers, and finally were able to get out and uh, get to a place and now in western Ukraine. So you just think about those stories. And, um, you know, one of my, my friends, she helps uh, with uh, her and her husband really help a lot with the, the ministry when we uh, go over. And um, he, he told uh, Marina that she needed to leave. And uh, he was, you know, he had to stay, of course, but to take their children. And uh, she was uh, telling us that um, she um, was got to the border and, they stood outside for like eight hours. Uh, they didn't have any food uh, for the. She got three kids and uh, little Mariana. She's a little bitty, little bitty girl. And you know they're just asking for something to eat. And she said, I mean, she's just crying. She's breaking my heart because I don't have anything. You know, and it's cold. It's uh, snowing. It's thirty degrees outside. And and so that's just a typical uh, of of what a lot of them have been through. Uh, and. I can't, you know, we struggle getting to church when I, when we had smaller kids, you know, if you get two or three kids and get them in the car, you know how that is, it's like a circus. I can't imagine some of these who were in, literally in cars for two or three days with preschoolers and uh, to, to try to get out and get to a place where they had shelter. So. Knowing, knowing that with the, the way things are going, that um, they very well could be killed and targeted to be killed um you know not it just seems like at least what we're seeing in the news that um uh, there, there's not there's not much effort being made and and at a minimum there's not much effort being made to avoid mm -hmm. the um the death of civilians yeah and, uh, yeah and that's um you know some of the things that you're seeing on the news now um a lot of these things i have been hearing for weeks before this because of people, uh, in particular the one I just mentioned from his own. Uh, the, when, she, when I first got word from her the first time, she said, we left, said the soldiers were just, just shooting women and children in the street, you know, and we're trying to get out, and, and so fortunately they were able to. Uh, but so this has been going on, the, the atrocities. It's just hard to uh, wrap your mind around uh, the cruelty and what's happening to kids and and so it's, it, it is a bad situation. Um, it's encouraging, too, though, that, uh, um, you know, in some of these places that are just getting shelled unmercifully, uh, pastors are staying behind and they're ministering to people. And, you know, in the midst, midst of all of that, uh, one of my pastor friends in Poltava, which is on the eastern side, he sent out a message last week because they're, they're, they're in the east and 
they're fearful that things are going to get really bad. And he just sent out a message, and he kind of copied me on it, and of course had to get it translated. Thank the Lord for Google Translate. Uh, but anyway, he's just giving them instructions, and his last words were, he said, "No matter what happens, I'll be here, and I'll be at the church if you need, you know." And they have a basement, and they've been taking in refugees, and they actually had a young lady give birth there in the basement about a week or so ago. So just all kinds of things. It's just really unimaginable for us uh, to think so, about. So people are. Um, having to leave their homes, their jobs, and family members. Mm-hmm. I, I, correct me if I'm wrong. It seems like you may have mentioned about some were even having to leave their parents behind right? because mm-hmm. they just couldn't travel. Exactly. But their parents insisted they would leave. And yeah, that's been uh, – in uh, Harkiv, uh, we, um, we knew a, uh, a man um, – he was over what maybe we'd look at as uh, kind of like the um, maybe associational missionary or something. He was over a lot of Baptist churches in Harkiv region, and he's like 86 now. And his son Dima, he he worked with us a lot, and uh, just got word a week or so ago that his dad's 86 and he can't be moved, and so he's just there taking care of him, not knowing you know what's going to happen. Um, some of the the younger couples that have moved on, their parents decided to stay home to protect their home. They said, "We've been here. We're not leaving," you know. And uh, it's just uh, it's amazing the the spirit, uh, the the national spirit. Uh, even you know, if you, even if you leave the Christianity part out of it, uh, you know, just their their love for their country and their homes. And and we I hope we would be the same thing, you know, to protect our homes and what we've worked for and. You know, and so a lot of the younger ones are trying to get their kids out, but their parents are staying behind, and, you know, and a lot of them are trying to talk their parents into leaving, and, you know, some of them don't want to. Okay. So um, now Ukraine, for that area of the world, is... I've heard people say that that is one of the strongest missionary-sending nations in that area. Is that... Yeah, I think that's pretty accurate. Um, of course, uh, when Soviet Union fell, I think uh, Ukraine declared their independence maybe in 91. I think that's right. Maybe 93, I'm not sure now. Uh, but uh, they, uh, they were very open uh, to the gospel. And uh, when we started going in the 90s, uh, it was, I mean, you know, people would come because, first of all, again, they're curious about Americans. They've never seen us. Uh, in, in live in the flesh, but uh, there's been a lot of churches established there. North Carolina, as a matter of fact, had the first partnership with the nation of Ukraine back in the 90s, and uh, a lot of North Carolina North Carolina Baptists contributed uh, a lot to building the seminary in Kiev, and so there's been a lot of good things happen. A lot of churches have been started, and uh, it's just it's been a blessing. And now uh, they are sending people out of Ukraine to other countries. And so I would say in Eastern Europe, uh, they are probably uh, the most evangelical and uh, reaching out and carrying out the, the Great Commission probably more so than I, I would say probably maybe than any country in Europe. Yeah. Okay. So is there any uh, anything that might be helpful for those here and those will be watching the video to understand just kind of about the geopolitical aspect of this and how that plays in with what's happening with the church and so forth or yeah i mean there's of course you watch the news and there's there's uh you know there's one side's truth and other side's truth and then somewhere in there there's the real truth about uh what's taking place but i mean a part of war is propaganda so we, it is we're not is. surprised by that but, but yeah uh, exactly and I was when I was there in December. A pastor friend of mine that I've known for a long time, and we were just sitting around his table. And I just, you know, asked him. I said, "What happens if you, if Russia invades?" And he said, "Ukraine will fight." He said, "They don't think we. They don't understand. We will fight. We've had our freedom long enough that we will fight." And so they, you know, they were a part of the former Soviet Union, and um, of course. Uh, when all that fell apart, and of course uh, Vladimir Putin now, uh, he says that's the greatest geopolitical disaster of the 20th century, and and so uh, from their standpoint, I mean, he thinks that Ukraine is and Russia are one, and he doesn't uh, want that to continue for them to be a free nation, but there's also uh, the um, uh, religious side of it, too. Um, 
you may have seen uh, one of the speeches he made recently. He said he was defending Christianity. And that's just so absurd considering all the atrocities that are going on. So you have a Russian Orthodox church and you have an Eastern Orthodox church and they've kind of, or not Eastern, but Ukrainian Orthodox. And so you've got that, uh, that part of it as well. And so it, they, they've kind of lumped in um, their political and their religious, so to speak, which, you know, there's danger of that in America as well. We see that as well. Um, and so um, it's just uh, uh, from their point of view, the Ukrainians would say to understand, you got to understand his mind. He's imperialistic. He wants to re restore the former Soviet Union. Uh, we've had our freedom. We, you know, we want to fight our free for our freedom. And, and some of those eastern uh, areas that uh, Russia has uh, now annexed and declared as independent states, I do know that a lot of the churches, the evangelical churches, have, they've, they've closed They've had to close because the government's not real friendly to anything that's not Russian Orthodox, and so so that's a fact. I have you know friends and their their parents still live in those areas or did up until recently, and um, you know they've said that you know they're they're not very friendly towards evangelical churches. It's the Orthodox or nothing, and so so that's that's the thing I guess that that, that well among many things that bothers me and should bother us that. Uh, they are going to, if, if Russia gets their way and takes over, then it's going to really hinder uh, the freedom to, to share the gospel. So, so outside of the Soviet, Soviets, not the Soviet, but outside of the Russian influence mm -hmm. and the areas maybe that they have uh, more influence upon or control over, um, the evangelical church has great freedom. They do. In Ukraine, they have freedom. I mean, it's, you know, you again, you, you hear all kinds of things, but I've been, you know, I can say that. I'm not an expert on anything. Uh, but, uh, you know, going in and out, uh, there's just, they, they have freedom to do pretty much what they want to do. I'm sure there's plenty of corruption in government, just like there is in any government. But as far as uh, your common everyday people in Ukraine, they have the freedom to preach the gospel. You don't have any limitations. You can go anywhere. You can share uh, the gospel. You can share, share tracts. You can do do all sorts of things. Um, you know, if you if you have a church, you do have to register the church. But uh, we do that here. I mean, you know, that's kind of uh, the same same deal. And so we've uh, had the privilege of being a part of quite a few church plants, so to speak. Uh, we just uh, were a part of one just a couple of years ago, and so uh, the, they do have the freedom to do that, and uh, and I'm thankful for that. And that's that's changed in the beginning. Even though they declared independence, there was still a lot of leftover stuff. So over the last you know 25 years, things have uh, opened up a lot more, uh, you know, and they, they've gotten more and more freedom, and especially in being able to share the gospel. So would um, would the freedoms they have just Say the the um, the common person in the local evangelical church there to go out and share the gospel, maybe on a campus or in public. How would that compare to what we find here in the United States? Uh, it might be easier um, in the Ukraine. Yeah, yeah. I, I really, um, I guess it's been probably fourteen, fifteen years ago. Um, I had a college student and. Uh, asked me, and I went and spoke at their university in Poltava, and um, I'm sure that was interesting with my southern accent, but uh, nonetheless, uh, I went in and spoke. But, but that was in southern Ukraine, right? So. That was in eastern Ukraine. Yeah, yeah, southern Ukraine, exactly right, yeah, yeah. And so, uh, so yeah, we had the freedom to do that then, and it's even more so now. There's just really, I haven't seen in years any kind of persecution matter of fact about the only uh opposition persecution would be a good word but about the only opposition that we've really ever experienced has been from uh religious people uh the orthodox church in some areas you know not don't take too kindly to evangelicals and baptists and things uh, uh and so uh under under communism 
the um, the Orthodox Church, they kind of talked about Baptists. There was a lot of bad things said about Baptists. Uh, they said that we were cannibals. The Baptists would uh, eat your children, and you couldn't uh, ta- you couldn't send your kids to these places. And so you dealt with some of that stuff. But now um, there's just I mean, there's just freedom uh, to do whatever. Uh, there's a church in Boring Kiev, which is near the airport in Kiev. We usually go in and out of there on the way, stay overnight or something, you know, to go to the airport because it's close. But they have tremendous ministry. They have barracks that they've built. They have kids' camps all summer long. They do uh, camps uh, like week-long things for seniors, for handicapped folks, uh, uh, all kinds of things that they have. And they're just at liberty to do whatever they want to do. And it's just great ministry. Okay. Um I wanted to just maybe maybe somebody here tonight has a um, a question that's really burning that you'd like to ask, and we'd like to give you a chance to do that. Um, anybody have anything at this point? If not, you might think of something. Gail, we want to uh, go ahead and say, it, and then I'll try to repeat your question so it'll be on the video. So you're wondering about the language? Is it a barrier? In what way? The Ukrainians, do they, the Ukrainians speak English? Is it a barrier? Uh, they speak, uh, most everybody over there speaks Russian and Ukrainian. Uh, a lot of the younger ones speak some English. Um, um, most places that you go into now, uh, churches and what have you, there's usually several people that speak English pretty well. Um, when we were first first started going, um, we were very dependent on on interpreters, and that's uh, that's very important too. And it's great when you have Christian interpreters, but that's something else that's changed over the years because there's more believers, and now everybody that we use are believers. And so I, I'm not sure what they preach sometimes while I'm preaching, but they interpret uh, probably better than than what they'd get uh, normally. But uh, as, but yeah, I mean that that's the thing you deal with, and. Um, uh, yeah, this, there's some there's some English. They're all they're kind of like uh, our generation that's in here mostly tonight. You know how we grew up and we went to high school and uh, I took French in high school and I can't even hardly ask how to get to the toilet uh, from what I remember. But so they did that with English a lot uh, of them and and so so a lot of the older ones they know several words of English, but a lot of the younger ones because uh, that's kind of a that's kind of a cool thing, and it's a ticket to to more prosperity if they know English. Then a lot of those have uh, have learned English, and so it's really not hard to find somebody that speaks English now. Okay. Yes, Lyles. Okay, let's go ahead. You want to repeat that question so it'll be on the video? Yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, he was uh, asking about uh, people that are, have been displaced. They don't have jobs. They don't have income. Uh, and the money, the monies that are being sent to provide uh, relief for them, do they have to travel a long ways uh, to get that stuff? Um, a lot, again, uh, if you look on a map sometimes, a lot of the people that have fled the cities now, this is where most of the, the refugees are coming from, the east and from the cities and that where the fighting is taking place. And so they're, they're moving to the western part and they're in all these border towns and different places. And so it's a lot more accessible. And, and they're, they're moving west toward the European countries. Towards Euro- European countries and they border Romania, Moldova, I think Hungary, uh, Poland all have borders with Ukraine, and so they're close there, and a lot of that stuff is getting over into Ukraine. And then uh, a lot of the things that, uh, you know, we, we give uh, some of the folks that I know personally that we help out, uh, they, are, uh, they have vans, and they will take their vans and load it down. Some of the pictures are interesting because you'll see sacks of potatoes and things like that, and they'll just be fill the van up, and they'll drive into some of these areas, and they will distribute this food, but then they will help those who have no way to get out, that want to get out, to get to the west. 
that's another thing. It's, it's different than here because a lot of people in Ukraine, they don't have a vehicle, especially if they live in the cities. I mean, some, some do more so than in times past. But a lot of families, they don't have any way unless they can get on a train, you know, or public transportation and, and all that. And so, but you have all these churches and these uh, places and Western Aid is coming in. Our missions dollars is buying stuff. And it's a lot, uh, they live on a lot less and they can get by on a lot less food than what we're used to. I mean, you know, they can make a, they can make a pot of borscht go a long way. Uh, yeah, and a little bit of bread, and so, um, so that I don't know if that answers your question, but um, they they are getting getting stuff, and uh, even like in Kiev, the you know it's still open to be able to they can get stuff in there. Of course, now I mean there's no Russian soldiers around, so now they can get stuff in pretty easily. It's just some of the like Mariupol. I mean that's an awful situation. People are literally starving to death there. They don't have water. They don't have they don't have anything. And so that's a tough situation because there's really not much way to get anything into there. And it's, it's dangerous, I mean, obviously, with all the, all the stuff that's taking place. Okay. Uh, in the back, yes, sir. L- Lewis. I'm sorry. We're, we're having a hard, you're so far back, we can't hardly hear. JB, you want to run a microphone back there? Well, let me just, let me just do this. We've got the black microphone. Take it back here real quick. Thank you. Hold it up close to your mouth. (laughs) Hello? Wow. Yes. uh, This is the first time talking in the microphone, so. (laughs) I wanted to ask you about, uh, because to me, it doesn't make sense the Russians just killing women and children, you know, just... Because I'm like, you're going to enrage that country after you invade it. Who's going to want to be on your side? So I guess, um, do you think that is true, all these pictures we're seeing about women and children in the streets being killed? Because I understand killing, you know, regular men. Uh, just for me, it doesn't make any sense. But I guess what is your point on that? Okay. Um I'm sure, again, as uh, Pastor Steve said, a lot of war is propaganda. And so I think, I, unfortunately, I think we've been conditioned in America, and I think this is a great problem that has occurred over the last few years, that we don't believe anything we see anymore, nothing, good or bad. Uh, but I do know, and personally, I know people that have witnessed these things going on. So I have very... So, so just to be clear, you know people that you have communicated with that, that said that women and children are being killed by yes, Russian soldiers. I, 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 yes, I, that is uh, uh, real, and it's from people that I've known for a long time, and they said this, this is what is happening. And so uh, whether it's on as large a scale as what they're saying, I have no idea, but uh, if you look back at history, uh, even during World War II, uh, we often think about Nazi Germany, but what we have forgotten is that Stalin was prob- probably murdered more people than Hitler did. Yeah. And when the Russians went into Germany, and I know they, they were vengeful, I understand that, but these same things were taking place. And from what we hear now, these things had taken place in Chechnya, these things had taken place in Aleppo, some of these other places. It just seems to be in the DNA of not all their armed forces, but I think some of the special units, it's what I understand from around uh, Bucha and Irpin, which, you know, you see a lot of that in the news. I was just there, been there many times, I walked those streets, and uh, it seems as if some, uh, some units, that's just what they were there to do, was to create fear and to try to just, uh, uh, for lack of a better term, uh, kill the, the population into submission where that they would not uh, fight back. And so, I, I'm, like I said, I don't know. I, I can't say right here, you know, that, yeah, absolutely everything you see is true. But I do know from very reliable sources that have told me that they've seen these things and they know that it's going on and they, uh, they're they terrified. Otherwise, uh, 
they would not be leaving in droves like they are uh, because, you know, in some of the places there's really not um, that much going on. It's the cities and the military sites that are being, uh, the cities, the, the larger cities that are being devastated, but in some of the other areas that haven't been struck yet, I mean, people are still getting out because, I mean, I would, I mean, if that was my kids and my grandkids, uh, I would, uh, and that's my concern, that's what burdens my heart that just rips me up is to think about, you know, I have friends who have kids and I, the, the uh, awful atrocities that are being reported, and uh, even if it's on a smaller scale, it's still horrible uh, to think about. So, again, I can't say, you know, I, I, like I said, I'm not an expert on anything. I'm just speaking on experience for somebody that's been a few times, but... Um, um, I, I do believe these things are, there are, there is some truth to, to them. How accurate the numbers are, I, I don't know. I, my personal, and it's just me personally, I think the, the deaths and the, the killings are much more than what they're saying on the news. Because it's taken about two or three weeks for them to document these things that I have been hearing prior to this from people actually there on the ground. And I don't, I mean, I'm not in contact with a lot of people. I mean, I may be, in the course of a day, I may hear from eight or ten Ukrainians, uh, from some in the cities, some in the, in the other countries, some in the western part of Ukraine. And so it's just, uh, I'm, I'm getting all that stuff. That's kind of where I'm getting a lot of my info from. All right. Larry, we'll let you take the microphone now. We've got time for maybe one or two more questions here. On uh, one hand, you have uh, a President Biden saying that uh, he's not going to provide Ukraine with jets to help them defend themselves. Uh, they have pilots that can, can fly these jets. On the other hand, recently you had Biden uh, call Putin a, a war criminal. You know, it seemed like before he was, uh, Biden wanted to make sure that he didn't upset the apple cart with, uh, with Putin. Now he's calling him a war criminal. Do you know if that's going to ease up the uh, fly, flying of jets over there to uh, help Ukraine defend themselves? Um, I have no idea about any of that, uh, and I don't know what's going in that we probably don't know about. Um, and again, um, the political thing, politics or politics, uh, my, my heart and my concern really is for the church and for the citizens, and, uh, you know, I, I'll leave all that up to... Um, to our lovely uh, leaders all over the world, uh, that they can uh, they can make those decisions. But uh, I think you know we as as believers, I think our primary focus needs to be on praying and caring uh, for believers there in Ukraine, and not just believers, but that the gospel uh, would go out and that people would would be saved as a result of this. I mean, that's hard. Um, to think about people losing their lives, but I also know uh, that uh, if you well, if you read the Bible and if you read church history, uh, this is uh, it's not an aberration. This is something that has went on for forever, and um, you know uh, God uses these things as hard as it is for me to accept uh, to get His word out, um, and that's you know people are asking for prayer over there. I'll get a message. You know, every now and then, okay, this is happening right now. Pray for this right now. And it is a lot about what's going on with them. But the underlining thing with all that is uh, the believers, they, they understand that, like Paul said, for me to live is Christ, but to die is gain. Uh, they understand that there's a bigger picture, that God's sovereign, that he's in control of all this. And ultimately, as all true believers do, as hard as it is for us in our flesh, we are praying that uh, God's purposes will be accomplished. It really puts new meaning on Romans when it says all things work together for good for those who love God and who are called according to his purpose. It's pretty easy for us in first world countries to say, well, yeah, you know, I, I had a flat tire on the way to church and I'm bearing my burden. But this kind of puts things in perspective of when all this is going on and you can still say, Somehow God's working this uh, for his good, even for us in all this. And so that's, that's encouraging. And so, yeah. All right. Anybody else have a question they'd like to ask? 
All right. Uh, th this is uh, referring to Zelensky. Maybe you know him more than me. Just I want to know more from you since you seem to an expert on this. Because I have an issue with him about forbidding of political parties. I know you say you don't want to talk about politics, but you know, saying they're all. I mean, he banned like ten political parties in Ukraine. Do you think he, if he wins, he will be better than the Russians for Ukraine in the long term? Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, I understand, um, you know, I know, I think you said you were talking about him banning political parties. Uh, yeah, I, that that has happened, uh, but I think that's more, I think, I don't think anybody had a problem with it because I think they were trying to focus everybody on the same page type of thing. And, and there, there are a lot of people in Ukraine that are, that before the war, uh, they, if you would have asked a lot of them in eastern Ukraine, I have friends of mine who, uh, one good friend of mine, his dad was former KGB, you know, and I've ate with him and all this, and he would have said, I think Ukraine would be better off under Russia and with Putin in control. But one thing that uh, this has done that the, the Ukrainians never has been able to have been able to do. It's united Ukraine and their, to be honest, their hatred for Russia. And now that they have freedom, uh, they don't want to be under that anymore. Now, what will happen with the Zelensky in the future? Uh, I, I have no idea, but I think, well, just from being there and knowing and, and knowing people in, in Russia, um, that's that's another thing. I mean, the people, the soldiers that have came into Ukraine, they've been amazed at the standard of living in Ukraine. I mean, it's like these people have washing machines. You've probably seen those pictures. Uh, you know, the, the soldiers have just looted and taken washing machines because they've never, a lot of people in Russia have never seen one and never had one. Uh, you know, and they've got like, um, they got Nutella in the, in, the, uh, in the cabinets and stuff. We don't have this, and every home here has it. And so the, the prosperity... Comparatively speaking, life under the Ukrainian government has been much better. Freedom, uh, you can go about, uh, you know, do uh, whatever you want to pretty much, you know. And I have to think that uh, that, is, it, that has to be better than what would be to come. Uh, because I really think that their goal, if they could, would be just to, to wipe out any any independence of Ukrainian uh, culture or anything else because they don't want to ever have to deal with this again uh, from, from Russia's point of view. So, and I don't want to get into too much. I start getting into my opinions on things, and that's not worth anything. So, Right, yeah. Well, what, um, as we kind of, clo well, John, we'll, we'll take one more question here. John Anderson. Donald, uh, you may know the answer or not. Are you hearing anything about the Russian people not knowing what's really going on? Are they the soldiers or anything saying anything that that they just don't know? I think a lot of the Russian soldiers had no idea what they were doing. Um, I think they thought they were um, they were in those training exercises in Belarus, and uh, a lot of them were conscripts, which they had signed up for a year because they have to. Some of them, I think, really were told they were going on training exercises, and some of them, I think, really didn't even know where they were going when they marched into Ukraine. And I'm not saying all of them. I think there were some elite units that knew exactly what they were doing. Um, and so, but the Russian people, I know it's hard for us to understand this, and we have, uh, we have one of our church members that's going back uh, to Russia, and she's been living there for two or three years. And, uh, and so uh, she came home just a few weeks ago. But uh, it's hard for us to understand that when the media, and we talk about that here in America, but we have no clue what we're talking about, uh, media control, there is really media control. I mean, you, I mean, very little access. And, I mean, it's sort of like if you go back in time, I mean, you know, we've got, our phones, and I know a lot of people have phones there, but like at home and television, stuff like it's just not a big deal. And so what they see, basically, a lot of them, especially the older ones, all they've ever seen is is what they've been told. I mean, they are clueless, and, and they really, the ones that are supporting the war, they think that Ukraine has attacked them. At their, I saw a news thing the other day, and it just had a map 
uh, in, in uh, Russia, it was a news broadcast, and it said this is what Ukraine desires to do, and it showed them branching out and taking over all of Russia. And it's like, that's not even, I mean, I don't know how you'd believe that, but after years and years, that's all they've heard, then that's all they know. And so, you know, kind of like, again, you think about World War II, um, how much do the German people know? I don't know. What's their responsibility in this? But I think they have been, uh, uh, they've, they've been brainwashed, so to speak. Uh, and so they, they have a whole different perspective on things. And so I think there's a lot of those soldiers uh, that um, know exactly. And then again, I mean, every guy, everybody has to make a decision about right and wrong. I mean, when it comes to these atrocities that are taking place, I mean, that's whether it's commanded or whether it's not, you have to make those decisions. And so, yeah. Okay. So if someone wanted to help, mm -hmm. obviously we can pray. And I'll ask you about that in a moment. But um, what would be your recommendation of how people could help if they wanted to try to help financially in some way? Well, I think, you know, we've talked about, um, I think uh, one good thing is Baptist Men, North Carolina, uh, there you can designate that to relief in Ukraine. I think that's a good way uh, to give because it, it is going directly towards uh, humanity. Here. I just went out. No, I'm back. I'm back. Uh, I think um, uh, that is a, a good place to give. You can give through the convention through send relief which is uh helping out in various countries there they are um so you know we'll talk about praying i guess at the end but you can give uh you can go there are places uh like this north carolina bad state convention uh there's already been teams from north carolina that's been there uh, matt caps pastor down at uh, in apex i uh, saw where they had been on a trip and in, so, into western ukraine or uh, well, the they've border to like Poland to the border to the border countries, and you know we've been able to. Uh, I uh, I'm a part of a, a an organization, I guess uh, what you would call it, but it's a it's a nonprofit uh, Ukraine challenge that uh, we uh, are able to get uh, funds in. We're limited. Uh, we had funds in country uh, that we're glad that we had. It's helped a lot of people. And then as we can, uh, we're, we're getting funds over there. So that's another uh, another way, another means to, to get things in, uh, financially speaking. And, and again, just, uh, you know, pray. And I'm praying for an end of this war. And I'm hoping that uh, uh, for a good outcome. And there's going to be uh, a lot of rebuilding that's going to take place, uh, hopefully. Uh, to help with these churches and uh, to help with these local pastors and things. And so uh, that's kind of my heart uh, for the future. But I think those are, those are good ways uh, to give uh, through, through our denominational. All right. Out. So, and two or three things specifically to pray for, obviously, the end of the war. But as far as the church, Christians, mm -hmm. believers there? Yeah, I mean, just, just pray, you know, I, it's just hard to... It's hard to wrap. Okay. It, it's kind of hard to wrap your mind around being in a situation that they're in, uh, with just kids and uh, families being displaced, and just trying to to find. I, I can't even imagine. I mean, it's been forty six days since they uh, invaded. Uh, I can't imagine this going on for months of how they're going to continue to be fed, uh, take care of their families and, and things like that. So, so pray for the families, pray for the church, pray for those pastors who are uh, staying behind and ministering. Another thing, praying for, there's a lot of guys that are, uh, they're going back and forth and taking help to people, but they're also helping people get out of areas of danger. I have a friend of mine. Um, they just recently they were in a in a city, not or an out, uh, outlying area of Kiev, and a missile hit uh, the block they were in. They were everybody in the van. Everybody was fine, but there's a couple other vehicles are just totally annihilated. And so you got all that going on. There's just the the danger and everything. And just just pray as they would pray. You know, help us to help us to to continue to be faithful in the midst of all this. So. All right, well, um, we, um, 
want to thank you for being with us tonight. Well, thank you for the invite. Uh, I always enjoy talking about it, and uh, sometimes I talk way too much about it. No, but, uh, no, anyway. this is good. Can we, can we thank uh, Don and Janine for being here with us tonight? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, well, let's, um, let's close with a word of prayer, and um, let's uh, be sure and be praying for the Ukrainians, the believers there especially. Father, we thank you, God, that, um, that we could uh, get this special report tonight from, uh, from Pastor Don, and uh, Lord, it just, um, Lord, just gives us greater insight into what's taking place in the lives of believers there, and Lord, um, we, we just pray, God, that you will be with, uh, with those that love you. I pray, Father, that, um, that in the midst of uh, all that they're going through, Lord, that, um, that they would just be strengthened, Lord, that their souls would, uh, would be drawn to you, that you would just pour grace into their lives like they've never known, and God, that uh, their passion for the gospel will only increase, and Lord, that through all of this, that you will provide opportunities for, for even unbelievers, unbelieving Ukrainians, and, and maybe even people in some of those border countries where they're going, that they might hear the gospel. And Lord, come to you through this. And Lord, that would certainly, that would certainly be an example of all things working together for good with those who love you. So Lord, we, um, we, we do pray for that. We pray for this war to end. And we pray, Father, that, that through it all, the church will be stronger. And Lord, that the church will be purified. And I pray that as believers here in America, God, that... Um, that through this and watching this and seeing what the church in Ukraine is going through, Lord, that we might learn some lessons from this and see, Lord, that, um, that we need not hold too tightly to the things of this world, but, Lord, that our eyes might truly be fixed upon eternity and, Lord, that we might be laying up our treasures in heaven. Lord, I pray for Don and I just pray that the ministry that he's specifically involved in, that that you'll give them great wisdom as they look for um, just the most strategic ways to make an impact and to help the believers there and unbelievers alike. And we just pray, Father, that, um, that their ministry, God, will just have your great blessings upon it. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you all for being here tonight, and, um, and we will look forward to seeing you midweek and next Sunday. God bless you.